take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Haba'a the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion. Next year. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Study School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Hebrew College in Massachusetts. He is well qualified to bring you these Bible messages. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. Welcome back to Theology and Perspective, and I'm Daniel Woodhead, the Bible teacher for this program. I'm blessed that you could join us again as we again explore this wonderful prophecy that was given to the prophet Ezekiel about 2,600 years ago when he was taken captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, the king and general, if you will, of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. <clears throat> Now, this prophecy describes a allied invasion by the Russians and all today we would call them the Muslim nations surrounding Israel. The invasion comes from the north, led by the Russians, under a man whose title is Gog, G-O-G. -G. And what we see happening here with Gog is that he is lusting after something in Israel. And God, knowing this, uh, the text says he put hooks in his jaws. <laughs> it was like putting a bit in the mouth of a horse to lead him around. And uh, the prophecy, as we've looked at in the first seven verses, or eight verses, if you will, shows that <clears throat> the nations that are aligned together under the leadership of Gog come into Israel from the north and they go up the mountains of Israel. Now, what is interesting about this beside just the particular nations that are aligned, but when this happens, now when this happens is a unique time period because the text says it happens in the latter days. And uh, if you were with us in our last session, we were trying to determine when are the latter days from the biblical text. And what we noticed was that the Lord Jesus, uh, whose Jewish name was Yeshua, he gathered his inner circle together, Peter, James, John, and, and uh, Andrew, to discuss the latter days. And he said, when nation rises against nation. Now, what I find really interesting about this is that's an idiomatic phrase. It's a Jewish idiomatic phrase from the Old Testament. Hebrews would call this the Tanakh. That's how they refer to their Bible, if you will. <clears throat> but in Christianity, we refer to it as the Old Testament. Same book, same text, slightly different organization, but same text at any rate. And uh, <clears throat> what we looked at was a couple of verses, uh, uh, you know, referring to this end of times, if you will, or last days. Now, <clears throat> we saw one from Second Chronicles, and we saw one uh, from another passage, but what I want to do today is I want to show you a couple of other Jewish sources that speak to this same concept, nation rising against nation, city against city, area against area, country against country. The Zohar Chadesh states, that at that time, wars shall be stirred up in the world. Nation shall be against nation, <clears throat> city against city, much distress 
shall be renewed against the enemies of the Israelites. Is that happening today? Look over there. Look over there. The Bereshit Rabbah, which is a commentary on Genesis uh, by the Jewish folks, it says, If you shall see the kingdoms rising against each other, in turn, then give heed and note the footsteps of the Messiah. Now, it's interesting. The footsteps of the Messiah means the Messiah, the sent one, who Jesus claimed to be, the text says he is. I know there's a lot of dispute, and many of our Jewish friends would uh, deny that, <clears throat> which I understand. I understand. But um, nevertheless, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Others said he was at the same time, too. So now the rabbis are clearly teaching that a worldwide conflict would signal the coming of the Messiah. Now what Yeshua did is he just corrected this a little bit. Because he said, when the world war occurs, now that doesn't signal the coming of the Messiah, but it signals the end of the age has begun. That's what I'm talking about here, and that's what the text is saying, the latter days. So these birth pangs that Jesus talked about are the same as the footsteps the rabbis talked about in the footsteps of the Messiah. So what, what this has to do is a series of events that lead up to the coming of the Messiah. World War I, which ran from 1914 to 1918, was the fulfillment of this particular prophecy because it was the first time that the entire world was at war. And I think you can get all historians to pretty much agree on this, that World War I and II was just a, um, it was the same war, uh, almost the same countries. And they both, both of these wars had a huge impact on Jewish history. World War I gave a lot of impetus to the growth of the Zionist movement. World War II led to the establishment of the Jewish state. Now, since World War I, history has entered the last days of the church age. But the last days are an extended period of time. That was just the first birth pang. So the sign that the end of the age, or the latter days, if you will, had begun is this worldwide conflict that was initiated with World War I and then continued on with World War II. But, you know, Jesus uh, does describe that these calamities being the beginning of sorrows is like a woman being in labor and having a baby. The idea is that the birth of a baby after these birth pangs, which are increasing in frequency and increasing in intensity, give birth to a baby when a lady is pregnant and she's about to give birth. What Jesus is talking about here that the birth pangs are going to increase in intensity and increase in frequency, and it's going to give birth to the Messianic age when the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, will run the world government from Jerusalem. He'll be sitting on David's throne. He will be running the world government in a way that it has never run since the Garden of Eden before the fall. Now I'm going to move on here with our text in Ezekiel, and I'm going to look at verses 10 to 13. As we've established now, the latter days began with World War I and continued on through World War II, and there was enormous benefit to the nation Israel. One, World War I established the Zionist movement and firmly planted them in the land. World War II, because of the Nazi Holocaust and those horrible genocidal persecutions, the world gave the Jews that land. The land that they're in now that some have called Palestine in the past, but they gave them that land. The United Nations voted overwhelmingly in favor of this. doesn't matter what people are saying today. And I'm not even referring to the biblical mandate that gives them that land. I'm referring to the United Nations in 1947. But let's look at the text. It says here, 
Ezekiel 38 verses 10 to 13. And I'm going to just going to give you what the American Standard Version of 1901 reads. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, it shall come to pass in that day that things shall come into thy mind. Now he's talking to God now. And that thou shalt devise an evil device. And that thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. And I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls, and having neither bars nor gates, to take the spoil, and to take the prey, to turn thy hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and against the people that are gathered out of the nations, that have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the middle of the earth, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take the spoil? Hast thou assembled the company to take the prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take great spoil? So, now this section discusses the concept as to why this invasion takes place on the part of Russia. The key reason for the Russian invasion is a matter of spoil. Now exactly what Israel has that Russia would want, it's not spelled out in the text. So the text just means cattle and goods and silver and gold. These are general Testament references for spoils and war. And there's been a lot of speculation about what it is that Israel has that the Russians want. Now, uh, some have speculated that the Dead Sea it contains 45 to 50 billion tons of sodium, chlorine, sulfur, potassium, and so on. Um, <clears throat> could be the reason, or others say that, uh, well, there's an oil crisis and it's been going on for quite a while, and it may be that uh, the uh, invader, uh, the leader of the invader, Gog, and his Russian counterparts here, see that uh, if they can get into the Middle East without upsetting the Muslims, then they can get close to the Muslims who have the oil. Now the Muslims are going to welcome any help in destroying Israel because it's their stated purpose. But the text states that the reason is for Russia's own premeditated efforts. Russia wants what the Jews have. Or it says they devise an evil thing and resolve to invade for the purpose of spoils. Now you may not know this, but uh, there has been much oil and gas exploration in recent years taking place in Israel. And they've discovered massive amounts of shale oil and some of the largest natural gas finds in the Mediterranean just off the coast of northern Israel. That may be one of the reasons. But there's also a second group of nations here in this verse that we looked at. Now, now they're protesting this invasion. Um, they recognize that it's invasion for spoil and for nothing else, and, and uh, it's called Sheba and Dedan. Again, back to the Old Testament, family names, individual people groups, we look to see who these are. Now, these are countries that are in northern Arabia. And they show that uh, at least some of the Arab states are not going to favor the Russian presence in the Middle East. And another is uh, Tarshish, followed by this phrase here, and all the young lions thereof. Uh, that is a puzzler because there's been much speculation on that one, too. Some people say, well, it's, uh, it's the United States. Tarshish is uh, the young lion at any rate. It's England, Great Britain, and her young lions are her colonies. Some say it is um, Spain or, or even Africa. But whatever it is, the, um, <clears throat> that the, these countries come out of the bigger country. The young lions come out of the bigger ones. We don't know who exactly they are, but these countries don't go beyond a protest stage. So Russia succeeds invading, and then the invading army is disposed of with no help from the protesters. They just look at this and say, gee, you shouldn't be doing that. Now, isn't that how the world is today? 
we see some of the most heinous activities going on. We see our government saying, well, that's not right. Nothing's done to correct it, though, is it? You can see this prophecy in real time, in real people, in real countries. Now let's move on with the text of Ezekiel 38. Verses 14 to 16 say, Therefore, Son of Man, prophesy and say unto God, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, In that day when my people, now my, listen to this, my people, that's what God is saying, that they're his people. Israel dwelleth securely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place, out of the uppermost parts of the north, thou and many peoples with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Listen to this, as a cloud to cover the land. Now it's a reference to a lot of people, a lot of armaments, a lot of armies, if you will. It shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring thee against my land, that the nations may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee before thy eyes. Woo! Before their eyes, if you will. Now the invasion begins, <clears throat> and this Confederate army covers the land like a storm in a massive swarm, if you will. Now Israel's, Israel's a nation now, and it's, uh, and it's got reasonable security, knowing that they have statehood. They got legitimate statehood. They are dwelling securely. Some would say they're not dwelling securely because uh, there are nations that are trying to overrun them. Well, there are nations that are trying to overrun us and everybody else, but we are dwelling securely. Now, I don't think that is a reasonable um, concept to uh, adhere to. I think dwelling securely just means that. <clears throat> They own the land, they have been given the land by the United Nations, and they are dwelling there securely. It's interesting is that the uttermost parts of the north is a direct line north of Jerusalem to Moscow. Um, then there's the initial success on the part of Russia here. It says, uh, <clears throat> God's reason is given for allowing this invasion to come to pass us over against Russia's reasons. Now remember, Russia wants to go because there's spoil there. God says, though, he wants to be sanctified in the eyes of the nations in light of what's about to happen. In other words, he wants the nations to know who he is and that he's controlling these things. In addition to that, he calls Israel my land. My land. He's going to prove to everybody that will listen to him he's always correct and he's in complete control of all events on the earth. You know, he does things for his own pleasure and he will extract vengeance on those that have harmed his Jewish children, the apple of his eye. Now I want to move on here a little bit and I want to go through uh, verses 17 to 23 which discusses the destruction of the invaders. So, having described God's purpose here, which is to bring glory to himself, he moves on to discuss how, how all this is going to happen. <clears throat> so look what he says here. This is really interesting. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Art thou he of whom I spake in old time by my servants? the prophets of Israel that prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord Jehovah, that my wrath shall come up into my nostrils, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the birds of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth 
and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, and the mountain shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. And I will call for a sword against him unto all my mountains, saith the Lord Jehovah. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. That's a civil war. And with pestilence and with blood will I enter into judgment with him, and I will reign upon him and upon his hordes and upon the many peoples that are with him, an overflowing shower and great hailstones, fire and brimstone, that's sulfur. And I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am Yehoah, Jehovah, the Lord God of heaven. So we got this question here, um, or that has been a question, about uh, what um, these Russians are invading Israel. Why are they going to do this? And they're invading a land that is the apple of God's eye. They've touched it with all their persecutions over the last couple hundred years, starting with some of the early czars. Even Catherine persecuted them. And the wife of Jehovah, one of the terms used in the Old Testament to describe God's love for his Jewish people, is violated. That arouses God's anger so that he moves out in judgment against them and he's going to destroy the invading army. Now, now this is followed by the answer to the question as to how the invading army is disposed of and destroyed. It, it gives us several causes here. Earthquake. A civil war breaking out amongst the invading soldiers themselves, pestilence, blood, flood, hailstone, fire, and brimstone. Now, since these things totally destroy the invading army without the aid of the other nations, God's purpose is seen as a success. He meets his objective like he always does. He's sanctified in the eyes of many people. In other words, the world sees this. The Jews see this. They know that the God of this universe is protecting them. Now I'm going to go into the 39th chapter, verses 1 to 6. Now this follows what is referred to in hermeneutics as the law of recurrence, because it just gives more details about the same things that have been talked about. Uh, in the previous section, uh, which would be Ezekiel 38. Now I'm going to look at 39 verses 1 to 6 here, and we'll look at those in a little more detail. And thou, son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will turn thee about, and will lead thee on, and will cause thee to come up from the uttermost parts of the north, and I will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, and thou with all thy hordes and thy peoples that are with thee, I will give thee unto the ravenous birds, of every sort, and to the beast of the field, to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord Jehovah, and I will send a fire on Magog, and on them that dwell securely in the isles, and they shall know that I am Jehovah. Now, now here's some new information that we're getting here in uh, the second and the fourth verse, chapter 39 where the armies are said to fall specifically on the mountains of Israel, they extend the length of the center of the country, beginning at the southern point of the valley of Jezreel, at the town of Janine in uh, the Galilee. Uh, it's biblical, Ein and Ganim. But they continue south until they stop at a point just north of uh, Beersheba in the Negev. That's way down in the south. 
These mountains contain the famous cities of Dothan, Shechem, Samaria, Shiloh, Bethel, Ai, Ramah, Bethlehem, Hebron, Debir, and, but more importantly, Jerusalem. Now that seems to be the goal of the invading army. Yerushalayim seems to be the goal. Now, now here's another example where the Six-Day War set the stage for the fulfillment of this prophecy. Because up to the Six-Day War in 1967, all the mountains of Israel, except for a small corridor of West Jerusalem, was entirely in the hands of the Jordanians. Only since 1967 have the mountains of Israel been in Israel. Thus, that sets the stage for the fulfillment of this prophecy. And another thing to know that uh, the King James, which I love, has got a mistranslation in uh, verse 2 because it says one-sixth of the invading army is left alive. That's not true, and it conflicts with verse 4. Uh, it was just a mistranslation. The poor uh, folks uh, translating the King James didn't have some of the manuscripts that have been found since then, like the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. So they didn't have some of the better information, and even that from some of the older translations and the older uh, Hebrew, if you will, um, it, there was doubt about that particular translation. So the whole issue of translating uh, the Bible is one that's very, very complex, and uh, it's a, we can have another discussion about how that's done. But neither to say that every one of the invading army dies. Everyone and none of the Jews die. Now let's look at Ezekiel 39, verse 6. And he says, I will send a fire on Magog. On them that dwell securely in the isles, they shall know that I am Yehovah, or Jehovah. So not only is the Russian and the Allied army destroyed, but the land of Russia itself is devastated by the raining of brimstone, it causes a whole lot of destruction to the nation itself. What this ends up with is Russia ceasing to be a political force in world affairs. Ceasing. They are no longer a force to be reckoned with, or they will not be after this happens. There's a couple other verses here about sanctified amongst the Gentiles. Now, this is what God is saying he's going to do here. Let's look at verses 7 and 8, where he's speaking in the first person now, and he says, And my holy name will I make known in the midst of my people Israel. Neither will I suffer my holy name to be profaned anymore. And the nation shall know that I am Jehovah, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it cometh, and it shall be done, saith the Lord Jehovah. This is the day where I have spoken. So, so there's a revival that happens in Israel, causing many Jews to turn to the Lord. Now, I'm going to close there for today, because we're going to get into another session in our next um, show that is going to talk about how long the weapons burn and how long it takes before any of the folks that are going to be burying the dead can even get in to the battlefield to do this. Uh, this is an incredibly uh, intricate prophecy talking about something that is yet future to us and it looks as if the stage is being set, the players are in place, the attitudes are there, and we're going to look at the reasons for this in our next session, along with these seven years the weapons will burn. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 384, Pentwater, Michigan, 49449. That's Post Office Box 384, Pentwater, Michigan, 49449. Or call us at 1-877-706-2479. 
That's one 706 2479 Once again, that's one 706 2479 The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. Take us there, take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hero Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion. Next year.